Hello, everyone. It's great to be speaking with you, seeing you, uh, talking to you from behind the Meerkat microphone. Friends, thank you, Phil, for your introduction. My name is Steve Malkinton, but please <clears throat> do call me Malk, and I love Jesus. I'm a pastor in the Uniting Church, working as a part of the Pulse team within the New South Wales ACT Synod, so across the two states that are connected down here. Our team, the Pulse team, uh, is focused on developing, resourcing and supporting work with emerging generations, everyone up to about the age of 30, give or take. And my role specifically connects with the northern parts of our state. So that's about from here right up to the border and out as far west as Gundawindi-ish. Uh, it also has a statewide focus on ministry with young adults. Otherwise, I'm Michelle's husband, Luke and Lily's dad, a devoted lover of Lego and smoked meat, and I don't mind playing some guitar. Thanks so much to Phil and to Jonty for the invitation to share with you today. Um, I hope that I don't let you down. Is that the right way to say that? Oh, let's say that's what it is. Before I start, I invite you to pray with me, please. Creator God. Speak to us today through your scriptures. Reveal yourself afresh in a way that enlivens your spirit within us. Prompt us to act, Lord, and hold us from the sin of complacency. In these words, may we hear your voice. All for your glory and your kingdom. Amen. I acknowledge that sharing your story can be tough. In no small part because it means that you have to share things that make you vulnerable. In this spirit of vulnerability, I ask you please to be gentle and warm as I give you an overview of my life so you get a bit of an idea as to who I am. I was born at a young age, long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, late last century, and was dragged up in a uniting church at a time when books had no E and were made of thinly sliced tree. I remember fondly walking down the lane from one church building to the next in Dubbo, leaving church to go to Sunday school. I remember my parents and both sets of grandparents loving me and encouraging me to grow in my faith, as did many within the Kiwana Waters Uniting Church where I spent my teenage years with my family. These people encouraged me by helping send me to two NCYCs, remember them? Uh, events that broadened my faith horizons and transformed my understanding of Jesus. It stirred within me a calling I didn't properly understand or get to apply until much, much later in life. This calling that allows me to reflect on one of my first big decisions after I gave my life to Jesus during confirmation classes when I was but 13. Now, I enjoyed science when I was at school, and I know you'll be surprised to hear this, I was a bit of a nerd. I had decided, through no consultation with others, least of all God, that I was going to become a forensic chemist long before CSI made it sound cool. This is what I was preparing myself to do through careful subject selection and occasional study. I got the marks that I needed to go to uni and I was doing okay in all of my subjects. As soon as I learned that pracs, however, were just me making my little titration or resultant assay, whatever, and we didn't get to work in groups anymore, I knew a life in science was not for me. Trying to contain this extrovert in a lab coat and not being able to talk with people was never going to work. So God opened a window. Not really knowing what it was, I toured in 1992 as the sound guy for a Christian touring ministry called Travellers. That is a great photo directly from 1992, friends. It was incredible. And for me, confirmed that involving myself in ministry was something, was somehow the thing I needed to do. The stories from this, uh, uh, <laughs> from this time are best served later at night on a couch, preferably with some form of beverage, 
um, or maybe next time I get to share with you. I didn't totally know what this call to ministry meant and I'd only deferred uni for 12 months so I still had that chemistry degree to go back to. Now, I won't bore you with some of the fine details. I didn't finish that chemistry degree and there is a lot of water under the bridge from here. I applied within the Uniting Church. We call this candidating. I candidated twice. In 1993, for the specified ministry of youth worker, which was a thing back then. And again in 1994, this time to be a minister of the word while I was working at Laidley Hatton Vale Uniting Churches in the Order of St. Stephen. Spoilers, neither of those ministry applications uh, worked out. This really threw me for a six after coming back from Travellers because I knew, I knew that God was calling me into something. And here was the church telling me that essentially they didn't want me. It was a huge blow and one that has taken a lot of work to process and for me to come to some understanding about. I got married not long after I turned 21 uh, and not long after finding out I wasn't accepted to be a minister. Looking for work, I took a job on the Central Coast and we moved from Brisbane to Terrigal. Sadly, my first wife and I broke up in 1999 and we both separately moved back to Queensland, alone and broken. It is no surprise that I was asking some big questions of God during these times. Not least of which was, what's the deal? I was prepared to do whatever God wanted, and I did my best every time I had an opportunity to be involved in God's mission. I met Michelle, in, uh, and we married at the end of 2001. We're shortly about to celebrate 19 years of marriage, and while the things she has taught me are too numerous to list... Most seem to involve picking up after myself and saving rather than spending my money on fun, frivolous things. I leaned into my burgeoning IT career. I figured this was something I knew a little about and could turn my hand to it and managed to mostly stay employed up until about 2016 when I was made redundant for the fourth time in my working life. During this time, I served in a variety of ways in my local congregation, uh, mostly in the music ministry. An opportunity in 2016 opened up within the Queensland Synod, uh, within the Digital Discipleship Project. And after three different people sent me the ad and told me to apply for it, I did. God was at work and I was prepared to do whatever was necessary to fulfil that which I believed that God was calling me to. Are these working? Here we go, I need to go back one. There we go. During that time in Queensland, I established Breadfish 2, a digital, in real life hybrid community of young people who loved Jesus a little and wanted to love him a whole lot more. This door opened for a calling into the Pulse team, which brings me to stand in front of you today. Friends, I can absolutely testify to the grace, mercy, and love of Jesus Christ. Without it, I would have long given up on this entire Christianity thing. God has used people to love me and care for me, to make sure I was okay, welcome me into community and, look, sometimes at best, put up with me. My faith has helped me come to understand who I am, where I fit and what God is calling me to be prepared for. There are a number of amazing people who cared for me as a child, supported me as a teenager, as I made decisions about identity, belonging and purpose for myself for the first time, and invested in me as a young adult so that my understanding of what was possible with God developed and blossomed before their very eyes. Being aware of God's calling on their lives, they met me in my needs and did not abandon me. They saw God at work in this mess. Is there another slide there, Phil? Where's my Lego sheep going? That's all right. There's meant to be a picture of some Lego sheep. We can deal with that. 
This passage, thank you, Lindy, uh, from Matthew 25, pulls no punches. Jesus is very direct in how he is communicating with the disciples in a last-ditch attempt to help them understand not only what he was expecting them to do, Jesus wanted the disciples to understand the implications of their actions before he was to leave them. Now, this is right before Passion Week commences, where Jesus is arrested, put on trial and crucified. It doesn't get much more intense than this, and Jesus knew what was coming. He had to make sure that his friends at least heard him talk about what was involved in the work he was leaving them to do and that it had eternal consequences. The disciples would have been right to ask Jesus, why does he talk like he's running out of time? This, determin this determination of our fate when we face our Father is absolutely confronting. Not only because it means that we need to acknowledge that we are being held accountable for our actions, we are also being held accountable for the way we have played our part in God's mission. There is no escape route, no opportunity to talk our way out of it. We face the very realisation here that based on what we have done in relation to that which Jesus asked us to do, will determine if we are seated on the favoured side of God or sent into eternal punishment. The expectation on us seems incredibly simple, yet we know from experience it can be immeasurably dif difficult. It's outlined in verses 35 to 36 for us. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now we should know by now that when the Bible repeats something, when something's repeated in the Bible, it's to make sure that we know it's important. In this passage alone, the expectation of who and how we help is repeated a total of four times. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us that this call to action is no mistake. He, being Jesus, comes to us in the form of a beggar, of the dissolute human child rag in ragged clothes asking for help. He confronts you in every person that you meet. As long as there are people, Christ will walk the earth as your neighbour. God continues to be at work around us and within us. The real question that we need to ask, what are we prepared to do about it? In getting ready to speak with you tonight, I reflected on our shared history as a movement and I came to the sudden conclusion that there were a few apologies that needed to be made. Young people, I am sorry that we let you down when we ended the specified ministry of youth worker. It left a void within our church that we haven't begun to recover from and you and your peers are the ones that have suffered for it. Now we have seen our mistake and we look to God's graciousness and generosity at work within you as we ask you to join with people like me so we can turn this ship around and get ministry with young people back on course. I'd also like to apologise that we, the older people in the church, haven't always done a great job of caring for you and listening to you. We haven't offered empathy when we should have. We haven't been the best neighbours to you and to your peers. We haven't offered you a safe place where you could develop your own sense of identity, belonging and purpose knowing that we could have stood beside you in all of it and we should have loved you. I'm sorry that we have not involved you in the hands and feet mission of God, that we have allowed you to not take seriously what God asks of us because we haven't taken it seriously ourselves. Verse 40 rings out with its clarion call that whatever we did for the least of these who are members of God's family, so we did to God. 
The best way for all of us to learn how to engage in the mission of God is to be involved in it together. I'm also sorry that we have seen you as strangers and not welcomed you. Honestly, we've been afraid. And your presence, in part, has reminded us... <clears throat> sorry. Has reminded us that we haven't been doing the things that God asked us to do. This list, at least in my head, goes on for some time. Understand, though, that these apologies are not your get-out-of-jail-free card. Part of reconciling and rectifying these issues is to invite you to take ownership with us and help us solve the great issues the modern church is facing, to transform who we are and how we function so that we can learn from our mistakes, to so radically change the culture of our congregations, that you and your peers will know that the welcome offered is not only genuine, it is life-giving and life-changing. So, what are you prepared to do? The 1987 Brian De Palma film, The Untouchables, is damn near perfect. It tells the tale of a federal treasury agent, Elliot Ness, who is tasked with bringing down the biggest gangster in Chicago's history, Big Al Capone. Now, you might think that putting a glorified accountant on the case of a monster criminal seems stupid. That is, until you realise that the police department in Chicago was so infected by corruption at Capone's hand that they had to bring in someone from the outside to catch him. And it turned out the best way to do that was to prove that he hadn't paid income tax in nearly 12 years. Kevin Costner stars as Ness in his first lead role. Robert De Niro put on 30 kilograms to play the mod boss Al Capone. It's Andy Garcia's first feature film. And Sean Connery absolutely owns this flick as the former Irish beat cop turned Ness, Sam Malone. A certain turn Ness mentor, Sam Malone. It has the most magical soundtrack, haunting and full of tension. The story is phenomenally and brutally told, which is why we're not about to see a clip from the film as much as I would like to show you. Uh, look, I appreciate it's no Joan of Arcadia, but what is? All through the film, Malone keeps challenging Ness, asking him, how will he catch Capone? Malone knows that Capone won't play by the rules and urges Ness to keep thinking how far he is willing to go to pursue this gangster. At a key moment, Malone admonishes Ness when the latter questions himself at overstepping the boundaries of the law. He puts one of yours in the hospital, you put one of his in the morgue. That's the Chicago way. As we reach the climax of the film, the team learn that Capone's bookkeeper is on a train out of Chicago to lay low while the heat is applied to his boss in court. Only the bookkeeper can decode the ledger that has been kept so that it reveals who has been paid and how profitable Capone's business is, critical to Ness's case. Malone learns that the bookkeeper is on a train at midnight and tells Ness to meet him at his apartment later that evening so he can give him this vital information. Before Ness can arrive, Malone is brutally gunned down by Frank Nitti, Capone's number one hitman. Somehow, Malone drags himself along the hall floor to his lounge, blood seeping from multiple bullet wounds to his chest, legs and arms. Ness arrives to find his friend almost dead on the floor. He kneels down next to him, cradling him as Malone lets out a pain-filled cry and reaches for the time time trained timetable so in his last breaths he can give Ness the detail he needs to put Capone away. He grabs at the timetable and thrusts it at Ness and with every last ounce of effort he wheezes and coughs out a question that haunted Ness the entire film. 
What are you prepared to do? Ness grabs the phone and calls for an ambulance, but it is too late. Malone has given his life in aid to Ness to seek a and face justice. So what are you prepared to do? For me, I was prepared to never lose sight of the call of God on my life. Was it easy? No. Did it all get wrapped up in neat little packages? Not a chance. I absolutely knew God wanted me to do something for him, even if it took me not getting called to be a minister. So I spent 20 years as an IT professional so that when the time came, I could engage in leading the church in digital ministry. Then I'm glad I stayed close to God and that I allowed the Holy Spirit to lead me. I can tell you there were many times that I questioned God's logic. I now continue to serve, ironically, back at Terrigal Uniting Church, where I first served 25 years ago. I just happen to have a whole different and much larger family with me this time, who I serve alongside with a mix of great pride and deep humility. What are you prepared to do? What do you need to hear or take notice of that God is calling you to do? Is it a vocational call to serve? Is it a step into mission or Pulse's ULEAD Plus gap year program that will help you test that call? Do you need to undertake a period of discernment? Is it a call to feed the hungry, clothe the poor or visit the incarcerated while working hard at the job or career you have now? Do not misunderstand me. We are all called to engage in God's mission in the world. And it is time for us to stop making excuses, to step through the apologies and get on with the mission of God. The Holy Spirit exists here with us now to empower us as we lean into that which God is calling us to do, all for his kingdom and his glory. As long as there are people, Christ walks the earth as your neighbour. What are you prepared to do? Amen.